Well, today we're going to make a Han Solo blaster noisemaker. So this isn't going to end up looking like Han Solo's blaster, uh, but it sure is going to sound like it. It's very simple. All you need to do is uh, find a couple things around the house. You need a cup, a disposable cup. It can either be plastic or paper. Uh, you need to find a slinky. It doesn't have to be the same size of slinky. It can be any slinky that you have around the house. Uh, and then a pair of scissors. You, and I definitely think you should ask your adults for help with the scissors on this one. Uh, so all we're going to do, we're going to take a cup. I'm going to pick a plastic cup to start with. You're going to take your scissors and make a little hole in the bottom of the cup. Um, I found that it works best. I've tried several different ways. I found that it works best if you make the hole off to one side, not right directly in the center. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. This is the part where I think your adults can help you. Carefully make a small hole. And that's it. We just have a little hole in the cup. You're going to take your slinky. And uh, slinky is if when you pull it apart, you take one of the ends and stick it through that hole that you made in the cup. It doesn't matter which end of the slinky you use. And then you're going to rotate the slinky a few times so it stays in the cup. So there, so you can see inside the cup, we just have a little bit of the slinky wrapped inside to keep it there. Um, but the, most of it, the slinky is hanging down from the bottom of the cup. And that's it. Now you have your Han Solo blaster. Like I said, it doesn't really look like a Han Solo blaster, but listen to this. Welcome back to Science Works Online. My name is Toby. We're going to do another Star Wars experiment. This time we're going to be making edible kyber crystals. Hello, my name is Maya and I usually do the science news for our Science Works live streams last week. All right. Well, today we're going to make a Han Solo blaster noisemaker. So this isn't going to end up looking like Han Solo's blaster, uh, but it sure is going to sound like it. It's very simple. All you need to do is uh, find a couple things around the house. You need a cup, a disposable cup. It can either be plastic or paper. Uh, you need to find a slinky. It doesn't have to be the same size of slinky. It can be any slinky that you have around the house. Uh, and then a pair of scissors. You, and I definitely think you should ask your adults for help with the scissors on this one. Uh, so all we're going to do, we're going to take a cup. I'm going to pick a plastic cup to start with. You're going to take your scissors and make a little hole in the bottom of the cup. Um, I found that it works best. I've tried several different ways. I found that it works best if you make the hole off to one side, not right directly in the center. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. This is the part where I think your adults can help you. Carefully make a small hole. And that's it. We just have a little hole in the cup. You're going to take your slinky. And uh, slinky is if when you pull it apart, you take one of the ends and stick it through that hole that you made in the cup. It doesn't matter which end of the slinky you use. And then you're going to rotate the slinky a few times so it stays in the cup. So there, so you can see inside the cup, we just have a little bit of the slinky wrapped inside to keep it there. Uh, but the, most of it, the slinky is hanging down from the bottom of the cup. And that's it. Now you have your Han Solo blaster. Like I said, it doesn't really look like a Han Solo blaster, but listen to this. Welcome back to Science Works Online. My name's Toby. We're going to do another Star Wars experiment. This time we're going to be making edible kyber crystals. Now, if you may remember from the Star Wars movies, kyber crystals are those special crystals that the characters will, will put inside of their lightsabers when they're making them. Um, and it, it's what determines the color of the lightsaber. Uh, for example, Luke Skywalker, his lightsaber was green because he had a green kyber crystal inside. Um, and Darth Vader's was red because he had a red kyber crystal inside. Um, so for this, there's a lot of supplies. Um, and impo more importantly, you need to get an adult's help. We're going to be using the stove to heat up a solution. 
Um, and so that's something you really need to go grab an adult for. Uh, but that being said, I'm going to show you the materials that you need for this. We're going to need some sugar. We need a saucepan. We need something to measure with. So I have this, or I have something like this. Something to measure out. We're going to be measuring out four cups of sugar and one cup of water. Um, so whatever you can find to measure that would be great. Um, we need a spatula to stir our solution once it's on the stove. And as you see, I have my Chewbacca spatula here. You need some clothespins. One clothespin for per kyber crystal. So today I'm only going to be making two kyber crystals. I'm going to be making a green one for Luke Skywalker and a red one for Darth Vader. So I only need two of those. So here's the food coloring. Again, green, Luke Skywalker, red, Darth Vader. And then you just need a couple of glasses like this that you're going to soak your, your kyber crystals in for a few days. And last but not least, you need some skewers. I have four skewers here, but I'm gonna put two of them away. I'm only gonna be making two today, so I only need two skewers. I think that's about it, so why don't we, why don't we meet back over by the stove? I'm gonna go ahead and measure one cup of water and four cups of sugar. So it's gonna be a highly concentrated sugar solution. Um, and then I'm gonna heat it up over the stove. So let's meet over this, by the stove. All right, we're back by the stove. I, I'm heating up our solution, our sugar water solution. There are four cups of granulated white sugar in here and one cup of water. So we're just gonna heat it up over high heat for about three minutes. We wanna see all the little white crystals of sugar dissolve. And then we know we're done. I think we're almost done here. I can't see any more individual grains of sugar. So I think we're good. I'm gonna go ahead and turn off the heat and I'm gonna move this pot over a little bit. And we're gonna go ahead and cool off our solution for about 10 minutes. So let's meet back after 10 minutes. Okay, so we've let our sugar water solution cool down for about 10 minutes. Uh, if, if the solution's too hot and you put it into a glass cup, uh, you run the risk of that glass cup breaking. So make sure your solution is nice and cool before pouring it into the cups. Now, like I said before, I wanna make a Luke Skywalker and a Darth Vader kyber crystal. So in my first cup, I'm gonna put a couple drops of food coloring green for Luke Skywalker. I'm gonna do the same thing with red for Darth Vader into the other cup. Now you can make as many kyber crystals as you like. I'm just gonna make two today. So the next step is we are gonna take some of this sugar solution and pour it into each of the cups. You want it pretty full. Okay, so now, uh, in order to start the growth of these crystals, we need to get starter crystals on our skewers. So we're gonna take our bamboo skewer, let's start with Luke Skywalker's. I'm going to stick this end of the bamboo, bamboo skewer into the liquid. We're gonna make sure the skewer gets pretty wet. And then I just have a cup here with dry sugar. This is just your normal granulated white sugar. So you're gonna take your wet skewer and just stick it down into some dry sugar. This way you get some crystals of sugar already stuck 
to your skewer. So now we want to place the skewer into our cups using the clothespin. I want the skewer to be almost all the way in without touching the bottom of the, the glass. So that's where these clothespins come in. And it might take a little trial and error. So let's see. It looks pretty good. We're almost all the way to the bottom of the cup, but I'm not touching the bottom of the glass. My skewer is straight up and down in the middle. The clothespin is going to hold it in place. Let's do the same thing for Darth Vader. Get the skewer wet. Dip it in sugar. And then we're going to place it using the clothespin. There we go. So now this is a pretty lengthy process. All we do now is wait for the crystals to grow. So why don't we check in on them about once or twice a day um, and you can actually see your crystals getting bigger and bigger. Make sure you put these in a safe place, somewhere inside that's cool. Um, you can ask your adults for a good spot for that. Uh, so yeah, let's check back on these, on these throughout the next week or so. Uh, we should have a pretty good crystal going uh, in about four or five days. So happy May the 4th and we'll see you later. Thank you. Hello, my name is Maya and I usually do the science news for our ScienceWorks live streams. Last week, I did an interview with Colin, an ambassador to NASA, and we talked about Hubble. It was Hubble's 30th anniversary and Let's see what he had to say. Hello, Colin. Hi, it's nice to be here. Oh, no. <laughs> um, so you are currently a NASA ambassador. Um, obviously, you're a big fan of space. What um, are the most important things we can learn from studying astronomy? Well, I think we have to define what we mean by the word we. And so there are several we's, I guess. One we is NASA, as you mentioned, I, I'm a solar, NASA Solar System Ambassador. And um, that's a volunteer position at NASA. And uh, they give me lots of information and in return I agree to do outreach. So this, this would be an example, for example. So from a NASA viewpoint, I mean, astronomy enables them to really look out into space and understand how our universe evolved. It, it enables them to, to look at planets and understand how they formed. Um, it also enables them to, to look for other life and in, in, in other systems. So from a NASA viewpoint, it, it, it's pretty broad. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm a, a vol I'm an amateur astronomer. So I guess astronomy to me means understanding and, and learning about our galaxy, I like to look at the moon and the planets and the stars, look at other galaxies. Uh, one other thing I like to do is something called spectroscopy. Um, I can put a spectroscope on my telescope and look at a star and it will tell me the elements it's made of, which I think is incredible. Oh. So you've got this star that's millions of miles away, but I can actually look at what it's made of. And that's- How does that work with uh, the telescope? How does it know? Uh, basically, you, you actually take an image of the spectrum of the star and based on that spectrum, you can analyze it and, 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 and determine what elements uh, it's made of, and, uh, which is a pretty, pretty cool thing to do. I mean, obviously, many people listening to, to this, um, they don't, are not that involved in astronomy, so they must probably not even, maybe not even amateur astronomers, but they're interested in the night sky, and I think... I think it's fun for anybody to go out and look at the stars. They can look at the moon. They, they can look at the planets. Um, they can look at meteor showers. Um, we have comets coming through the sky at various times. Uh, they can understand the constellations and how they're for and, and what they look like. So even if you're not an astronomer or an amateur astronomer, there's an awful lot you can do by looking at the night sky and learn a lot. Oh, well, that's exciting. We also heard that you've been making your own telescopes, studying astronomy over the years. Do you have any telescopes you'd like to show during the stream? Well, mine are permanently mounted in rather a 
oh. big, uh, my office. But I did bring a couple of things to show you. Um, so, so one of these. Well, so this is a, a pair of binoculars. It's rather a large pair of binoculars, but um, I can see a lot through these. I can actually see planets. I can see the moons of of planets. I can look at the craters craters on the moon. Um, and then I brought I, one of my telescopes has gone wrong at the moment, and I have a big tube off it. I thought I'd show you that. It's a bit heavy, so this is one of my big what? telescopes. Um, <laughs> But you mentioned making telescopes. Um, one thing that we did at Science Works, we ran some astronomy summer camps. And um, so we actually, one of the members of our local astronomy group designed a very small telescope and we bought the parts for about $150. And students coming on uh, to the camp built their own telescopes and took them home. And in fact, one of the things I'm doing at the moment is, is working on trying to put together um, telescope kits that people can buy in the store. That's one of my long-term objectives here. So, uh, yeah. So well, my, 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 main mission, my main mission at the moment is to do outreach, to, to share my excitement of astronomy and the night sky with people. And any way I can do that, so much the better. You know? How can you view the craters of the moon with those binoculars? Well, so, I mean, you can actually see the craters of the moon with it. I mean, that's the other thing here is that people get wrapped up in technology and equipment. And you can go and enjoy the night sky without just your own eyes. And so if you look up at the moon, you can see craters. So really, the, I mean, my binoc what my binoculars do and what my telescope does is magnify the view. And so if you've got some binoculars at home, like if, say, you're a bird or you like to go birding and you have a pair of birding binoculars, you can just point those at the moon and, and you'll know, see the craters of the moon. I mean, you can see parts of the moon with your, with your naked eye. Um, you, you can see the, the oceans or the Mars uh, on the moon. Maris, I think that is a pronunciation. Um, but um, even with a pair of simple binoculars, you can see quite a lot. You can see the, uh, the moons of Jupiter, for example. What's one thing we like to do when we run star parties at Star Science Works is to show people a pair of binoculars and they can look through it and actually see the, the moons of Jupiter. They can see the rings of Saturn, but just through a pair of binoculars. So everybody at home can still participate, is what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I mean, obviously, you see more if you get out of away from light pollution. Um, so oh, true. If, if we don't in, think about that very much, but there is a lot of light pollution out there. Yeah, so if you're in the middle of downtown, it's more difficult. And that's not only because the sky isn't as dark, but it takes a while for your eyes to adjust to the dark. It takes about 30 minutes. That's why when we run star parties, we get a bit upset when the car comes in with its headlights on because it ruins your night sight. And it takes a good 30 minutes to, uh, to, for it to adjust again. You can try it. Go out. Go out from the <laughs> flight room and see how long it takes for, before your eyes um, adjust to the dark. So, yeah. Um, so, but we're here to talk about the Hubble telescope because it's its 30th anniversary. Mm -hmm. So how is what we see in Hubble different than what we can see with a regular, with our own eyes or with a regular telescope? Well, Hubble obviously costs a lot more money than my telescope, <laughs> um, but it's a, it's a lot bigger. It, it, it can do a lot more magnification. It's, it's other big advantage, of course, is, you know, it was the first major uh, space telescope. It was launched into low Earth orbit. Um, so it, that moves it away from light pollution. It also moves it away from uh, the other pollution in the air. So obviously it, it has a much clearer view of the sky. So it's bigger, more powerful, and it has a clearer view. And the key thing about it, it was the first space telescope to, to put into space. Well, that's exciting. And it does take pictures, right? So when we're looking at a Hubble picture, what are we actually viewing? Because some of them do look really interesting. They look like hands and we see other images in the picture just because we're looking for things that look familiar to us. So what is it that we're actually looking at when we look at a Hubble picture? Well, I think of telescopes in general, and particularly Hubble pictures, as, as time machines. 
in the words, you know, the speed of light is finite. It, it's 186,000 miles a second. Um, and so the universe is billions of light years in size. In the words, the light years is how far light travels in a year. And we're talking about the size of the universe being billions of light years. And so when we go and look at a distant galaxy, for example, we're seeing light as it was billions of years ago. So it, it isn't as it looks today. It, it has, in many cases, it was light as it was when the universe was almost first formed. And so it's like a time machine. And I, I find that quite fascinating. I can look at something and say, well, it's 10 years, 10 light years away. I know I'm looking at, at, at it was at the speed of light traveling for 10 years. Uh, and that's how far back in time I'm going. So it, it's a time machine. Uh, <laughs> that's what enables you know, NASA to really try and understand how the universe was formed and, and, and how it evolved. But of course, we like to look at the pretty pictures, and some of those are in fourth color. You know, they are not always the actual natural color um, of the galaxy we're looking at. In, in addition, you know, our, our, we see visible light. Um, the Hubble can also see ultraviolet light and infrared light, uh, which we can't see with our eyes. But photographing things, say, in infrared light, you can see different things you can than you can from you know, visible light. Oh, well, I drew my own image of a Hubble picture. You were going to tell me you were going to do this, and you're going to test me, <laughs> aren't you? I have, I, have, I have the picture of what it actually is pulled up, and I did know that colors don't really matter, but I tried to match it as okay. best to what I had. So here it is. Yeah, I, I, you told me you were going to show me one, but you wouldn't tell me what it was. And I thought, <laughs> I bet she's going to show me the pillars of creation. Oh, dang, but yes, that's that one. <laughs> right. it, it's, it's the top, you know, if you, I, I forgot how many, I actually wrote a note here of, um, the Hubble was actually um, produced 1.4 million observations, which is an incredible number, which has actually resulted in, what was the number I wrote down? 16,000 uh, technical papers being written, but, but the top, if we take the top 10, pictures taken by Hubble, the pillars of creation is, is one of them because it's it's a, just an incredible picture. Yeah. I really stared at it for a while and yeah. they, I noticed that these pillars are actually um, gas going up. So it was really hard to do a line drawing because you can't show the gas. Yeah. But yeah. if you go in and I'll show you, I'll show the viewers the image I drew from here. Yeah, that's an incredible picture. And uh, it's basically gas and dust clouds and parts of that. Uh, I think it's the Eagle Nebula that that, that was taken from. And um, uh, it, 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 there are they're like parts of that are star factories. Stars are being formed. And so people oh. refer to them as star factories. You know, so. Well, I drew my very own star factory. Yeah, you did a very good job. I, oh, I thank you. did a very good job, yeah, yeah. Um, so what's your favorite picture Hubble has taken over the years? Well, I, I actually, um, let's bring, my, I'm going to show it to you on my iPad. Um, it, I don't have one favorite picture, but I have a, a certain type of picture, and I'm going to show you this one. Can you see that? Oh, so, yes, I can. That's of two galaxies merging. Um, oh, so I was just Hubble, about to say Hubble, Hubble's taken a lot of pictures of galaxies that are, that are colliding or merging. And I, I find them exciting. And, and one reason is um, the nearest gap, one of the nearest galaxies to us is Andromeda. In fact, if you go out on a, on a dark night, you can actually see Andromeda, the fuzziness of Andromeda in, in, in your bear with just your eyes. Oh. And so an Andromeda is actually moving towards us. And mm -hmm. eventually it will collide with the Milky Way galaxy, which is our galaxy. In fact, we think of a collision, but there's so much space, they actually merge together. Uh, don't worry, it's not gonna happen. <clears throat> For anybody listening, it's not gonna happen in our lifetime. We're talking about billions of years in the future, but that picture excites me because it shows what will happen to our galaxy. <clears throat> Excuse me. And what will happen to our galaxy in the future. So yeah, that's some of my favorite pictures, I think. 
we might have more like 30 planets in billions of years from now is what you're saying well that's an interesting point actually because well we can get into a debate of what's a planet or what isn't a planet i personally think all pluto. true <laughs> i think pluto's still a planet personally but i'm old <laughs> um but um but if you say if you take pluto out we have eight planets right so there's this search for for planet nine or planet x if you count pluto as nine and um one theory is it could be another planet that was captured by our galaxy so they're still looking for this they feel there's another big planet out there that, 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 um, that we're looking for. So, yeah, we could get gain some more planets. So maybe we stole Pluto from another galaxy? I'm not sure about Pluto, but uh, <laughs> it's not a planet, right? They won't have to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, what do you think is Hubble's greatest discovery so far? Well, that, I, I, it's an interesting question. I, I mentioned to you it, it, it had done... 1.4 observ 1.4 million observations uh, it's resulted in tens of thousands of technical papers how how do you put one out i think the key thing about hubble is it's it's changed our perception of the universe you know i think before hubble um we had a certain view of what the universe was and how it's evolved and I think Hubble has, has changed that. It's enabled us to really get a better idea for how big the universe is, uh, how old it is. You know, it, it can, what, Hubble can look back 13 billion years in time. And so I think it's the key to me, the key thing it's, it's done is significantly changed our, our perception of Hubble. It's oh, already been our, changed. Our just... universe, so, yeah. <laughs> Even just this short conversation has changed my perspective on what is happening in space. So that's yeah, exciting. Go, go to a NASA website. And the, the amount of material NASA produces is staggering. And it, for any age, you know, they produce a lot of information for K through 12 projects to do. Just go on, you know, NASA.gov. There's just huge amounts of information out there. When I became a a volunteer at NASA as a solar system ambassador, one of the first things I did was to see how much information there are, and it, and it blew my mind how, how much <laughs> you know, it's staggering. Yeah. I do know that for all of our viewers, you can go and look up what Hubble took on your birthday whenever you were born, so you can go on to NASA and look that up too, to see maybe hopefully your favorite picture Hubble has taken. Yeah, I was um, too old for that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, true. You could still put your birthday and then another birthday. Like yeah, I can make one up. I just need to be less. I can pretend to be 20, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, because Hubble, It. I think it was sent in 1999. Is that correct? 1990, 30 years. Oh, 1990. 30 oh, 30 years. years. Yeah. Yeah, 30 I years shouldn't have that. <laughs> Um, so what does the future of Hubble look like? So, well, Hubble originally was intended to last 15 years, and it's lasted 30. Um, and, and, you know, things have gone wrong over, over, over the years. Things have broken down. Some have been permanently broken. Uh, things have been fixed. The, the general um, feeling is that Hubble's good for another five years to 2025 because we are about to launch, hopefully, fingers crossed, at the James Webb Telescope. Um, and that's, that's six times bigger than, than Hubble. Um, mm -hmm. be, and that keeps getting delayed. Um, the, if you, the official last uh, next date is January next year. Uh, the feeling I get is it could be delayed to the middle of next year, but certainly, in the not too distant future, we're going to launch a new space telescope that's, that's six times bigger and will allow us to, to go back even further in time um, than, than Hubble can. And I think what will happen is that James Webb will, will uh, do what Hubble does. Uh, it will very much take a focus on a, a lot of infrared photography. So, I, you know, I think Hubble over the next five years was much focus more on visual imaging and most probably ultraviolet imaging but even today uh, there's more scientists want to use time on hubble than there's time available so there's nothing there's not going to be any shortage of really people who who want to do things on hubble even if james 
uh, even if the, uh, the the web telescope launches. It also sounds like there's no shortage of data for that already exists that we can sift through if anybody well, wants to look at The other interesting thing is that going back to you asked me the, uh, the why of astronomy and I broke it into uh, NASA, uh, I, I broke it into amateur astronomers and I broke it into the, the people in general. Uh, amateur astronomers do a lot of useful work uh, for, for science because there isn't sufficient uh, really number of people to process all the data that NASA produces. So uh, it's an interesting task that many amateur astronomers wade through this stuff. But even, even if you're not an amateur astronomer, there's a lot of information out there that you, you can actually wade through and, and it, it, it's, it's, it, it's interesting to look at. And there are you might, become one, you might become an amateur astronomer by looking at these pictures. I think um, I, I, it's fun when you run star parties because you, you get people of all ages come along and many of them have never looked through a telescope before. And then you point a telescope at Saturn and they see its rings and, they, and you point it at Jupiter and you see its moons. And, and I think they're just blown away by it. You know? So, yeah. So, I'm still yeah. blown away. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all the questions I have about Hubble. It was a fun interview and I learned a lot about space. Well, thank you for <laughs> coming to ask me some questions. It's, I, I can talk for a long time about space, but the oh, important yeah. thing is go out, go out and enjoy the night sky. Yeah, thank I you. I will tonight. <laughs> okay. Thank you for watching. Again, my name is Maya and tune in Thursdays at two for more science news.